All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to lecture five. And before we get started, we'll just have a quick look at assignment three, since there was some questions popping up about that. So your client is extremely indecisive with what to do in their free time and want you to develop a simple program to make suggestions as to what they could do based on a few factors. This program should be able to store a weekday indicator. So you'll have to create a variable for this and this will be a Boolean value, right? Then the current weather, this will again be a variable and it should be a string value. And finally, you have another variable for the funds that the user has available to spend. And this will be a numeric value, right? So how would that look? Let's just have a quick look in PyCharm. All right, so in here, so the first variable we have is the weekday indicator. So what I would name it is, is weekend. Okay. And then to start it off as a Boolean value, I'll just assign it the value of true. Okay. And then similarly, I'll create the other two as well. So current weather, I can name it something like C-U-R-R weather. And this will be a string. Okay. So to initialize it as a string, I can make it an empty string. And then finally, we have funds user has available to spend. So this will be named, let's call it funds available. Okay. And we'll give it a numeric value of zero to start it off as a numeric value. Okay. So far, so good. Now let's go to our Word document again. So now in here, what we'll do is the client lives in a place where the weather is either nice, raining, or freezing, right? So you have these three options for the string value of this variable, right? This is what that means. So the program should verify that the weather entered matches one of these values, right? So before you even go through with all your other checks, first you'll have to check that the current weather is one of these three values. And if it is not, then you're, you have to just break, right? You just throw an error. Or just print out a statement to the user saying uh, you have to enter one of these three values, right? So how would that look? Let's have a quick look. All right, so we have our current weather. Let's give it the value of nice for now. Right. And how do we check if it is one of those three values? Right. So what we'll do is we'll say if current weather equals nice, right? Or oh sorry, wrong programming language. Say if or current weather equals raining. or current weather equals freezing, right? Now, if it, if it is not one of these three values, we want to throw an error to the user, right? So I'll just put a not over here. This all in a bracket. Oh. All right. So what this will do is it will check if the statement inside, if it is false, then this not will be true, all right? And now in here, I can say print, please provide one of these three, and then we can give them the options, nice, raining and freezing. Now, if I run this code right now, it will do nothing, right? Because we do have the value as nice, but let's say I give it another value. Let's say spring and I try to run this. Now we'll have this printed out to the user, right? 
please provide one of these three values. So now if we go back to the assignment, you basically just have to go through all of these uh, conditions, right? And create if else statements for these conditions, right? So I did it the hard way. And over here, there's a hint to use a set and then use an in operator, right? So I'll let you try that out yourself. But the basic idea is to go through this uh, list of uh, cases, if you will, and just make sure that the program does what it's supposed to do in each of those cases, right? So whenever it says the program should output, that means you're supposed to write out a print statement. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Sorry, any questions so far? No, stay learning. Okay. So, yeah, I'm not going to actually go through and write this code for you since this is the assignment, right? But if you anyone has any doubts while going through these, please let me know. So I have a question in chat saying assignment three was not posted. Let me just make sure. It's not the case. Oh, that is true. Okay, I'll just post assignment three into um, the classroom. So was your question in assignment two then actually, Jane? Just in one, because <laughs> that's where I'm stuck at. I've always been able to start off. Okay, so yeah, let's talk about your doubt after class then, all right? That, that's all right. Okay, so this assignment will go live after this class. So don't worry if you haven't seen this yet. All right, let's go to our lecture for today where we'll be continuing with more data structures. Right? So anybody want to just quickly mention in chat the data structures we've learned so far, just type them out if you want to. I just want to see how much we remember from the previous weeks. Anybody? Uh, okay, so looks like nobody remembers, but here's a list of some data structures that we've already looked at. So we've looked at sets, we've looked at arrays, we've looked at dictionaries, right? So what is a data structure? To remind everyone, a data structure is essentially a means for storing and organizing a collection of data, right? So you can have multiple of primitive data types, right? So you can have strings, booleans, numbers, et cetera, and you can store them in a bigger data structure to better organize that data, right? And you can also call methods to these data structures to perform actions on the whole data structure, right? So today we're going to look at lists, right? So what is a list? You will see that a list is quite similar to an array to some extent. The only difference will be that they can be of any type, right? In an array, we only add one type of element inside. So let's have a look. It is an ordered collection of non-unique values, <clears throat> sorry, that are of any type and are mutable, right? So what does that mean? Ordered means that the order in which you put the elements in, they'll retain that order, right? So for example, if you look at the example shown on screen, you make a list such as this, and when you print it out, it will print out in the exact same order, right? Then it is non-unique, right? So unlike a set, you can have multiple of the same values in a list, right? So in a set, if you put multiple values, those multiple values disappear, only keeping one of each. But in a list, we can have multiple of the same values, right? So you can see a lot of twos, a lot of threes, fours, two hellos, and so on, right? Then they can be of any type, right? Unlike an array, when creating a list, you do not need to specify the type of element within the list. And lastly, it is mutable. So you can alter the elements of a list, right? So if I call the ninth element in the list, I can simply change its value to 10. And when I print out my list, as you can see over here, the ninth element has been changed to 10, right? So let's, uh, before we go to our methods, let's have a look at 
how to create a list. So let's call it list one. Inside, okay, we'll put a bunch of items. And this is how you create a list. You started with square brackets, then put, a, put whatever you want inside, separated by commas, right? And that's how you create a list. Now I can print this list out if I want to. When I run this, I get this list over here, right? Easy enough. Now let's go and have a look at the methods. So accessing individual elements so like arrays elements of a list can be accessed via their index value right so lists are zero indexed meaning that the first element has index value zero second has one and so on right so we already had a look at this in an array where we start counting from zero and then whatever element we want we just specify the index number right you can use the concept of index to replace the value of an element with another value We'll just have a look at this. And then this can also be negative indexed. So you can start at the very last element with minus one, then the second last will be minus two and so on, right? So let's have a quick look. All right, so we already have our list created over here. Let's say I want to access this element, right? So the index for this is four, right? Okay. And I can, kind of help you visualize this. So this is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and last one will be seven, right? And we can print this out. So list one, and then we start the square brackets. And if I want to access this element, I will say four, right? If I print this out, we get three which is the fourth element in this list. Similarly, I can access the very last element with seven, right, of this one. Right. So as you can see, we got the last element by using seven. Now, another way to call the last element is to say minus one for the index, right? So if I say minus one in here, it will also give me the last element, right? So these two are the exact same thing, right? So this can kind of be useful when you don't exactly know the number of elements inside the list, right? But you still need the last element. So what you can do in that case is you can use minus one over here, right? Then similarly, if we do minus two, we'll get the second last element, right? This is the second to last element. Now I can also change the value of certain elements, right? So if I do list one, and then I want, let's say I want to change the value of this to a hundred, right? So I can say list one four equals 100. And what this will do is it will give this indexed position, the value that you specify on the right. So if I print out the list after we do this, as you can see, we've changed the fourth element to 100, right? Any questions so far? All right. So list slicing is our next topic. And basically what list slicing means is that we can slice a portion of our list and use it as its own list, right? So let's have a look at how we can do that, right? So we have our list over here. Let's say I only want these elements till the number four, right? I only want the numbers and I want to just get rid of the rest. So what can I do? So let's make a new list. Let's call it list two, right? And then we'll call list one and we'll say that, okay, I want the, I want to start with the zeroth element and I want to keep going until we hit the sixth element, right? 
and now if I print plus two, as you can see, we have our first five elements here. So how this works is the first index you specify here is included, right? So the element at the zeroth index is included, but the index you specify at the second time, which is six, is not included. So we the sixth element is this, so we get everything before this element, except the element itself, right? Another way we can slice is if we do, so we don't need to specify this zero at the very start. If we want to start from the first element, we don't need to specify it, right? So if I write list one, just start with the colon till six, right? This will give me the same exact answer as the thing I did above, right? So list two and list three will be exactly the same, right? So if you're starting from the very first element, you don't need to specify it. And similarly, if you want to end at the last element, you again don't need to specify the second one. So let's say I want the list starting with three till the very end, right? So what I'll do is I'll create another list four and then say list one, start with element three and till the very end. So I don't need to specify where I'm going. Then I can print this list out. So as you can see, it will get everything till the very end. So in this, you can also use negative indexes that is completely fine and they will behave just as a positive index would, right? So even if you, so this three could also be something else. So let's see. If I start at the very back, right? We get seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And the last one will be, oh, so we'll start with eight actually here because negative indexes start with minus one. Right. So this will be minus one, minus two, minus three, and all the way till minus eight over here, right? So if I want to create something similar to list four using negative indexes, what I will do is I will say list five. List five, sorry about that, is equal to list one. And then let's see what the negative index is corresponding to three, right? So three has the negative index of five, right? So we can say minus five till the very end. And this will give us the same exact result as list four, right? So using negative indexes in slicing is also fine. Any questions about slicing? All right. So here are our list methods, right? So most array methods will also apply to lists. And so if we have a look over here, uh, the first method we have is count, right? So we, what we can do is we can count the number of times a particular element is present in the list, right? So let's have a look at that. I'm going to get rid of all of this. All right, so let's say I want to know how many times three occurs in this list, right? What I'll do is I'll say list one dot count and then three. Now I need to store this in a variable. So let's call it counter equals this value, right? And then I can print out the value of counter. So as you can see, it says two, which means that the number of times three occurs in this list is two, right? Which is true. If we do the same for four and try to run this code, we'll get one because four only occurs one time, right? Okay. 
then let's have a look at the other methods. So we have extend. So what we can do is we can add a list to another list using the extend method. Then we have the reverse method, which will reverse the order of all the elements in your uh, list. And then we have sort, right? Then sort can basically is used to sort the elements inside your list. This is really useful when you have a numeric list, right? So let's have a look at this. So let's create another list, product list two, and we'll put a bunch of random numbers in here. All right. Now, what we can do is we can join list one and list two, right? So we can say list one dot extend list two. And now if I print list one, we can see that list two has been added to the end of list one, right? Now, what the next method says we can do is, um, let's see, so we can reverse the list, right? So let's try to reverse list two. So list two dot reverse. And if I print this two, as you can see, the elements have been reversed in their order, right? It was eight, six, nine, three, seven, four, seven, eight, and now it's the other way around, right? Now what we can also do is we can take this list two and sort it, right? So I can say list two dot sort and I can just leave the brackets empty. And if I do print list two, as you can see, it has gotten arranged in ascending order, right? Now, let's say I want to do descending order, then what do I do? So you use the same method called sort, right? But in here, what you'll say is reverse equals true. And what this does is it makes the sort happen in descending order. So now if I try to run this, you'll see it revert, it uh, sorts it in reverse order, right? So it's in descending order now. Any questions on these methods? All right. I think for me, it's just uh, recognizing when you're using brackets and when you're using the full stops and the semicolons and the comments. I think for me, that was the, when I got yep. to do it on my own, I realized that was the catch. Yeah, so let's quickly differentiate between those, right? So you use round brackets when you're using a method, right? Such as dot count or dot extend or dot reverse, right? That time you always need your round parentheses, right? But when you're trying to access an element, let's say I want the second element in list one, then you use square brackets, right? So if I do print list one, and then I use square brackets to specify the index of the element I want, right? So this is what we get if we do this. And similarly, in slicing, where we're taking a portion of the list, we again used square brackets, right? Because this is not a method that has its own name. This is simply grabbing, this is simply indexing the list, right? So if I do this, we get this, right? Is that clear somewhat? Yes. So uh, let me just repeat a bit of what you said. You use uh, brackets if you're writing a method. And if it's not a method, you use a square bracket. Not necessarily. There are other things that you can do which are not methods, which use different things. But if you want to index or you want to slice, you use square brackets, right? Okay. right. So let's go back. So lists and strings have a useful relationship. What does that mean? So whatever you can do on a list, you can usually also do on a string, 
and why is that because a string is essentially a list of characters right h is a character e is a character the space is a character the comma is a character and all of those when combined create our string so a string is essentially a list of characters so there are some methods that you can't call for example if you try to count if you try to count certain characters or try to index certain characters you'll get an error but what you can always do is you can convert a string directly into a list and then use those methods so let's have a look at that as well so let's create a string let's call it string one let's say hello world right? now what i can do is i can say friend and i can index everything in there right so let's write down the indexes for clarity so h will be zero e will be one and so on right so this is the zero is actually 10 and then this d will be at 11 right so i'm just going to leave it at nine So now if I do string one and then index it for the ninth element, as you can see, we get R because R is the ninth character in this string, right? Similarly, we can also do slicing on a string. So let's say I want just world, right? And I don't want the rest of the string. What I'll do is I'll say string one and then start with the seventh element till the very end. So because it's still the very end, I don't need to specify anything after the colon. If I print this out, as you can see, we get world, right? And you can store this in its own string, right? So for example, I don't want to print it directly. First, I can store it in another string. Let's call it string two. And then I can print out string two. Okay. This will give us the same exact result. Now, but if I try to do a list method that does not work with a string, we'll get an error, right? So let's have a look at that as well. So if I try to do string one dot count and then L, right? And if I try to print this out, okay, it does actually work. Um, they probably fix that in a newer version of Python since I made those slides. But there are some methods that might not work with the string necessarily, right? So in that case, what we can do is you can make it a list, right? And how we do that is we say list one, which can be any variable, right? Which we want to store our list. Then we say list and we start case round bracket. Right? So this is our function, which converts anything given inside to a list, or at least tries to. Then we can write string one, right? And if I do print list one, as you can see, we get a list with all the characters, right? Now we can call whatever. Sorry about that. All right, so list one dot, let's say I want to count. Now I can count it properly, right? Now oh, I have to print this out as well. All right, so if, if you find any list method that you want to use on a string, but you're not able to, you simply need to convert it first to a list and then you can use whatever method you want right so this is a very good relationship to know that a string is essentially a list of characters now we learn about tuples so what is a tuple it is an ordered collection of non-unique values that are of any type and are un immutable right 
So it is ordered. So that means whichever order you put the elements in, they retain that order and they're non-unique. So that means it's, it doesn't behave like set where it will remove the uh, repeated values. It doesn't do that. It will keep the repeated values and store them in whatever order you place them. Then they can be of any type. So again, it's not like an array where you have to specify the type. You can simply put in any type you want. So as you can see in the examples above, there's numbers, strings, and Boolean values in the same pupil, right? So now these tuples are immutable, right? So you can access each element, but you cannot change it, right? So if you try to do something like my tuple square brackets nine, so we're trying to change the ninth element to 10, it will not allow us to do that, right? So that is the only key difference between a tuple and a list that you cannot change the elements directly. In other ways, they are quite similar. So you can uh, index and slice a list normally, right? So you can call the ninth element, you can call minus two element, which will be second to the last. And then you can also do slicing, where you take a portion of the tuple and make it a new tuple, right? Uh, I would remind you to please mute yourself if you don't have any questions. Thank you. And once again, just keep in mind that you cannot change the values that are present in a tuple, right? So let's have a look at this. So when we were doing lists, right? Let's say I have a list with one, two, three, right? What I can do is I can change the element. Let's say I want to change the three to a four. I can simply say list one, two is equal to four, right? And then when I print out the list, you can see the value has been changed, right? But now if I try to do the same with a tuple, right? And a tuple starts with a square bracket, otherwise it will look exactly like a list, right? So if I do the same exact list as a tuple, and I try to call the same function, And I try to run this, as you can see, it does not like that. It will give you an error saying tuple does not support item assignment, which basically means that you cannot change the values that are present inside a tuple, right? You can still access the values. So if I just do print tuple two, right, it will still let me do this. So tuple one. Right. I can still access the elements. I just can't change their values as I could in a list. Right. And that is the only key difference between a tuple and a list. Otherwise, they're almost identical. So tuple will also have its own methods, right? So you can have the index method, which will return the index of whatever element you put inside the round brackets. Then you'll have the count method in, with which you can count the number of times a particular value occurs in the tuple, which is similar to the count method in a list, right? But because tuples are immutable, many of the methods that lists and sets have aren't possible on a tuple, right? So you can't add elements, you can't remove elements, you can't update the value of elements. You can't do any of those things. Once a tuple has been made, it cannot be changed. And that's all we have for today. Are there any questions on tuples? Or are there any questions from today's lecture in general? All right, I'll stop recording.